This video is about replacing an iPod Classic charge port, 5th generation, 6th generation, 7th generation. It even applies to older generations, the iPod 4th generation. Please visit zfixit.com to have your charge port professionally installed. There are many issues trying to open this device. You may damage it beyond repair if you attempt and you've never done this kind of work before. Here's an example of a charge port where the middle pins should be protruding out like the two outer pins on each side, but these are pushed in. There's a couple of pins also that are pushed in. This is a water exposed device, very badly damaged, fully recovered. Here's another angle. This iPod again was fully recovered. You see the pictures there before and after. Pads were rebuilt. We also do iPhone 5, 5C, 5S digitizer and LCD FPC replacements. This one was damaged by the owner. He ran a razor blade trying to lift it, but you can see the scratches. Uh, we still attempted this particular repair, unfortunately. With the new FPC, it still did not work. Part of the touchscreen was not functioning. Here's the uh, beginning process. This is an iPod Classic 6th generation. It's got a dent right in the center of the charge port. Unfortunately, folks, I can't show you how to open this device, but please keep in mind when trying to attempt to open these devices, you will sometimes damage them. Uh, please send it on to zfixit.com if you prefer us to repair this uh, particular type of device. Uh, charge ports generally have issues uh, with syncing or your computer recognizing the device. Uh, of course, then there's also charging issues. Uh, some are very mildly damaged, uh, not very noticeable. Uh, but if you look under a lamp with a flashlight, with a lamp or a flashlight, uh, and then you can also uh, clean it up with a toothbrush lightly soaked in alcohol. But uh, you'll need to like remove most of the alcohol from the toothbrush and just slightly brush it into the charge port just to get a better picture. That'll give you or allow you to view inside the port to see what kind of potential damage there is to the particular port. Uh, you can send us close-up pictures and we'll let you know if we see any any signs of damage. Other times the damage is on the inside such as moisture exposed devices and you can usually we are uh, good at, at removing this, the uh, charge port even though there's uh, moisture exposure on the particular solder points. It takes us about a minute, minute and a half to open the sixth generation, seventh generation, fifth generation are very easy to open. And then, of course, there's a certain process of opening this device. And then here's the assembly process. you got to use serrated tweezers. Never use smooth tweezers to lift the battery connector. Don't ever pry it up on one corner. It has to be lifted on both ends up. Here's the headphone jack and the lock switch being disconnected. You have the hard drive connector, which is just pushed up it's a locking mechanism now with the flex cable it needs to be gently pried sometimes it's in there very well and with a plastic spudger you just try to loosen it up this one gave very easily then you got the LCD F uh, LCD connection there's the bend on the charge port this one did not it would charge it just would not sync or get be recognized by the computer as being connected Okay, so here's the hard drive flex cable being removed from the logic board. Just lift up the locking mechanism and gently pull up. There's adhesive behind the flex cable. Here's the LCD flex with a spudger. Never use a metal tool because you will tear that flex cable. Always use a, a metal spudger. Piece of tape on the metal on the click wheel to keep the, the middle center click mechanism in place. Remove the screws on each side, three on each side. Now this is a zero 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 cross tip screwdriver that I'm using.
And with a metal tool, I prefer to use a dull, very dull exacto knife. I can't even cut myself if I slip. But just go in there and pry it, use it as a lever. And there is adhesive, and what you're doing is you're pushing the click wheel up because that will get stuck. So you, while you're prying up, you use one of your fingers to push the click wheel toward or up towards you. And you keep prying it. It'll eventually loosen the adhesive, but you don't want to push the pry tool into the logic board. You just want to grab a little bit of the corner and then just twist it using it as a lever. And at the same time, with your finger, push the click wheel up so it goes through. Usually there's adhesive behind the click wheel, so that's one of the things that holds it. The metal LCD backplate, make sure it stays down. You see the flex cable coming up. You don't want to rip it, but you just you don't want to lift that plate and you might possibly lift the LCD unsealing it. And of course dust will get introduced. Now if you want to clean it, of course, you can go ahead and remove the LCD with the back plate and you can clean the LCD out. There is still dust that gets in there. You see my way I'm doing it up, up, and you pick, be careful with the top uh, the topmost clip. It sometimes gets bent, so make sure you straighten it out if it is. There's the adhesive around the click wheel. There the click wheel gets kind of dirty around the edges and it kind of tends to get stuck. There's two screws underneath the click wheel. Remove those just uh, with a 000 cross tip screwdriver. Here's the cover to the or the plastic covering behind the charge port. It kind of protects. There's so many pins there, it prevents it any, from anything touching. So what you want to do? Well, you want to first remove that uh, spacer that goes between the hard drive flex that kind of raises it into proper position. It's just secured with adhesive. You just kind of just lift up, remove it. Don't slip, but you just get it out of the way. Sometimes that is over the piece of plastic over the charge port. Now remove the flex, I mean the the plastic protective coating that goes over the charge port. You can use capped on tape if this doesn't, if you cannot reuse this. Obviously there's water, moisture exposure, you don't want to reuse that because there's basically going to be particles of rust and corrosion on that. So then Captain works very well. So there you see the charge port and you saw some pins that are kind of pushed out. Uh, this is all due to the damage from the dent. One of the main concerns is to make sure that all the solder pads are still there. Usually they're okay unless there's moisture exposure. Of course I just use magnification to make sure. So the port was removed. There it is. Board has been, or the charge board is removed. Now I'm just cleaning it up. Always use flux whenever you're soldering. You don't want to um, ever do without flux, even though your your core might indicate that it is flux, rosin flux. Always use additional flux as it just melts off, evaporates. So there's the four anchor points on the charge port. Then you have the 30 points uh, that go on the charge port, of course, which allow it to communicate to the iPod. And here I'm just continuing to clean up the uh, the solder area. 99% alcohol. Never use that 70% uh, or stuff for uh, the uh, your hands that you use to, to you know that you buy at your local grocery store. It has moisturizers. Uh, within the alcohol and that'll leave a residue. So 99% alcohol is a good way to clean a board off. And then your toothbrush, make sure you clean it off as the rosin uh, or the flux kind of tends to accumulate on that brush. I never recycle used alcohol because you just introduce uh, all this dirty contaminants into the uh, container of the alcohol. So throw away whatever you use. The new charge port is here after uh, inspecting the logic board to make sure everything is 
is good to go. And I'll just normally I'll just position it, making sure that uh, sometimes the charge board has to be moved left or right. I'm just trying to do a dry run to see exactly is it off, is it perfectly centered, or do I have to put pressure left or right before I solder it in place. So normally I'll just put it in place, look under microscope or magnification to make sure that the pins are aligned and I see if there's any movement and uh, if there is movement I try to figure out what is the best kind of pressure to place before soldering back in. Of course this is all to make sure that the pins are somewhat centered they won't short out because uh, it is a very small area so I know exactly where it needs to be go sometimes they're perfectly centered you don't have to do anything Again, using flux. This is a uh, no clean flux that I am using. Now, some of this stuff is toxic, so just make sure you're wearing or, or you have some kind of carbon filter, uh, fume extractor, or you can wear a mask, uh, something to prevent you from breathing in the fumes. Uh, it does. Uh, uh, it's caustic. It does end up hurting your your throat after you breathe it in. I've found uh, so, just avoid it. So here I'm just cutting slivers of my solder wire. This just allows me to use my two hands versus other methods. You, you could put this possibly in a clamp, uh, maybe some, but there's chips on both sides, so you don't necessarily want to put it under a clamp because you could damage some of the chips. I mean, you could probably rig something up, but this works good for me. Instead of having a whole a piece of solder wire with a soldering iron, I can just cut the pieces of the solder wire and eliminate the need to hold that in place. And now I'll I just hold the charge port in place and use a soldering iron. Of course, it works wonderfully. It, uh, no need. I can do with all this with just two hands and avoid the use of a clamp. Other soldering iron, just, fake, just basically touch it, let the wire melt. You're not too concerned about getting a good coverage. You'll, once they're anchored in, you'll continue uh, working the solder wire in. After everything's done, inspect for any possible shorts. You want to make sure everything's good to go. So here's just some pictures of good soldering job that I'm uh, processing or have been processed. Just examples of what it should like should look like. Uh, you know, there's you always want a clean joint. Always use flux if you see any points that are not shiny uh, you will need to redo them uh, you might uh, if there's any uh, joints that are shorting or the solder has uh, formed a bridge you'll need to remove those bridges obviously it's a short uh, between two points and that's not any good so you'll need to rework those areas um, less is best you never want to overuse uh, solder on these fine points uh, the, the will bridge and then sometimes they're very difficult uh, to unbridge uh, so again here's just sample pictures of, of what uh, we do so I have inspected it uh, I'm just here I'm just trying to show you a picture I guess trying to get a close-up of what it looks like it's this camera doesn't do close-ups very well but you get the gist. It's uh, there. All there's no shorts, no bridging. Everything is all all solder joints are shiny. Again, here's more pictures of what it should look like. Nice and shiny, no cold joints. All joints from the solder pad to the charge port are making good, solid contact. And of course, there's a rear side. Clean it up.
it's no clean, but uh, it doesn't matter. I still clean it, but you can't get everything out. There's stuff probably still underneath the charge board, but it will not corrode or eat through any of the uh, metal. So there, there's a charging. Of course, this charge, the problem was with the sinking, but this is the iPod that's that was worked on, and uh, that really wasn't the issue. I just, well, obviously, after everything was assembled, just wanted to show you exactly, you know, it is charging, but uh, after uh, doing the repair, of course, we plugged it in, and the computer recognized it instantly. Uh, all pins were good. Okay, and there's the sample picture of what the solder point should look like after the repair is complete. And this is micro soldering at its best. I mean, you you don't get any any better joint than than the picture indicates. Uh, if you've never done this before, it's not a good idea to start on this. Uh, it's best to start on something that's uh, sm uh, does not require so many points to solder. Maybe a battery uh, on an iPod Touch 2. The only thing, uh, batteries and headphone jacks, even headphone jacks are a little bit difficult, but uh, this is not meant to be done by somebody who does not have years of experience doing soldering. Send it in to a professional. If not me, look up locally. There are some shops. I mean, they're probably regional. Uh, not many shops do this particular type of repair, and not many shops know how to open this particular type iPod, the 6th and 7th generation metal front. I've seen damages. We also do LCD FPC repairs. Here's a sample of a picture where the LCD was damaged. The, the locking jaw mechanism is lifted and gone. And some of the pins, of course, are broken, as you can see. And we do battery FPC repairs. It's a good example of a board that uh, basically they incorrectly tried to remove the battery FPC and it came out. Of course, it bent. We had to remove it. And uh, sometimes the battery FPC can be reused. Other times, it just needs to be uh, replaced with a new one. And these parts are sold. Thank you for viewing. Please visit zfixit.com. If you have any uh, questions, you can email me there and I'll respond. Uh, you can. There's also a shopping cart enabled. Uh, if you need to send the, any iPod Classic uh, for any type of repair, particularly for soldered, uh, micro-soldered parts.